song says, let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. There's somebody here today that needs the glory. You, you walked into this sanctuary defeated. But I came to tell you this morning that you are victorious. All right, y'all gonna get it when we say Clap your hands like this. Everybody, clap your hands here. Hey, one more time. Hey, I love the Lord. He heard my cry. Hey, everybody, let the glory, let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of our King rise among us. Let it rise. One more time.
everybody love Jesus this afternoon? Could you just wave your hands and give him a love wave? Come on, the story. No one can touch my heart like you. Or make me smile. Or make me smile the way you do. I finally felt someone. I finally found someone who. Oh, really? Who really truly loves me. And when my strength. And when my strength has.
if you all are glad for Jesus. I wonder if you're glad for Jesus, let me hear you say amen. Maybe God has done something exceptionally, exceedingly, abundantly above whatever you could have asked or thought. Maybe perhaps someone thought that you were on your way out, but then you look up and there you are in your wheelchair, but in church, Mother Bell. Yeah. People thought you were on the way out of here. But how many of you all know it's God that gets the final say? Come on, someone say hallelujah. Hallelujah. We have a, a lot of work to do today, and we have to do it in a short amount of time. And so this morning, I want to call our attention to a passage of scripture. I know uh, there was some misnomers. Uh, you all just stay with me for a second. I know there was some uh, misnomers. It, it, I didn't want uh, the teenagers outside. I wanted the teenagers inside because despite what many may think, suicide is the fourth leading cause of death among teenagers in the United States of America. And so they need to, <laughs> they need to hear what we're going to talk about. Um, this morning I want to, or this afternoon, I want to call your attention to a passage of scripture. It's found in the book of Job, the book of Job, the seventh, the nineteenth chapter, Job, the nineteenth chapter, starting with verse seven. And let's stand together in honor of reading of the word of the Lord. Job, the nineteenth chapter, starting with verse number seven. Job nineteen, starting with verse number seven. The Bible says, let's read all together. I cry out, help, but no one answers me. I protest, but there is no justice. God has blocked my way, so I cannot move. He has plunged my path into darkness. He has stripped me of my honor and removed the crown from my head. He has demolished me on every side, and I am finished. He has uprooted my hope like a fallen tree. His fury burns against me. He counts me as an enemy. His troops advance. They build up roads to attack me. They camp all around my tent. My relatives stay far, are you all reading? And my friends have turned against me. My family is gone. And my close friends have forgotten me. My servants and maids consider me a stranger. I'm like a foreigner to them. When I call my servant, he doesn't come. I have to plead with him. My breath is repulsive to my wife. I am rejected by my own family. Even young children despise me. When I speak, they turn their backs on me. My close friends detest me. Those I have loved have turned against me. I have been reduced to skin and bones and have escaped death by the skin of my teeth. Verse 21, have mercy on me. My friends have mercy for the hand of God has struck me. Must you also persecute me like God does? Haven't you chewed me up enough? Oh, that my words would be recorded. Oh, that they could be inscribed on a monument. Engraved forever in the rock. This is where I want us to get. I gave you the context so I didn't have to go through it. But as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives. And he will stand upon the earth at last. After my body has been decayed. Yet in my body, I will see God. I will see him for myself. Yes, I will see him with my own eyes. I am overwhelmed at the thought. I want to talk to you from the subject when the pain gets too hard. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you, God, for the assurances of your word. Father, we seek to understand what it is that you have said in your word to help us and encourage us in the difficult times and the tough times and the rough times. 
So Father, I ask that you speak to us as never before so that we can leave here different than the way we came. And God will be careful to give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory that will be due your name. In the most precious name of Jesus, I pray. Let everyone say amen. Amen. You may be seated in God's presence. You know, there are many things that Christians believe when it comes to the word of God. It seems that somewhere along the line, we have morphed and narrowed Christianity down to a few catchphrases to make the realities of life more manageable. Perhaps you've heard some, or have even said some of these. Listen, anyone ever say to someone or tell someone that God has a wonderful plan for your life? You ever heard that? That's not true. Literally, the text that they used to describe that, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. God had no wonderful plans for the weeping prophet Jeremiah. If God, anyone heard this one? If God opens and closes one door, he'll open another. Anyone ever heard that? Someone thinks that's in the Bible. That's not in the Bible. That's not even biblical. Or some people say, if God closes a door, he opens another huge, massive window. No, not at all. We've been told if God brings you to it, God will get you through it. <laughs> that is not true. <laughs> Sometimes what God brings you in, God brings you in and it kills you. Let's just be honest. God does not get us through everything. <laughs> uh, I've heard this other line over and over again. And it doesn't matter how deep and dark and disappointing or dismal or dreary or downright depressing someone's life gets, many times I have heard people utter these words in a feeble attempt to encourage someone uh, when they're going through a rough time. They attempt to encourage them by telling them, don't worry, God won't put more on you than you can bear. Anyone ever heard that? That makes no sense. As a matter of fact, it's antithetical to the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you could bear it, you would have no need for Jesus. One of the biggest problems as I, that I have with that saying is that it attempts to deliver comfort to the conflicted and disconsolate, but it stops short of the gospel truth. God won't put more on you than he can bear. We merely have to peruse the word of God and we can see an antithesis to that cookie cutter saying. And for our lesson for this afternoon, we'll dive into a very important subject where we'll encounter a man who God has truly put more on him than is humanly possible. God, through, 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 through the example of Job, demonstrates for us that there are things that will stretch the limit of what we can bear. God has told us in, in, in his word that, 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 that there are some things that are so depressing and so debilitating that you want to give up. And for Job, he spent almost close to 40 chapters of the Bible complaining about this problem and this disposition that God had placed him in. If we were to take a look at just a little bit of the context that Job is going through, if you take a look at Job, the third chapter, Job really starts to get to really complaining in Job, the third chapter. It's considered to be the lament of Job. If you take a look at Job 3, uh, 3 to 5, you would see that Job curses even the day he was born. He says, let the day of my birth be erased. And the night I was conceived, let that day be turned to darkness. Uh, he says later on in verse, in chapter, in verse three and verse six. Sorry, chapter three and verse six. He says, uh, he says, uh, uh, go to the next next slide. Verse chapter three and verse six. Chapter 3 and verse 6 says he wishes that the date that he was born would be taken off of the calendar. He questions in verse 11 why it was that he was even born. Why was, wasn't I born dead? He says, God, I should have been stillborn. I'm going through so much trouble. 
Why didn't I die as I came forth from the womb? He says in verse 12, why is it that my mother didn't just let me die? He continues this for, for chapter after chapter. And in verse 7, he really gets angry. And Job begins to describe this feeling in Job chapter 7, starting with the fourth verse. In Job 7, he says, lying in my bed, I think, when will it be morning? But the night drags on. He, he, he says he's a raging, sleeping insomniac as a result of his problems. He says later on in verse 16, I waste away. I will not, uh, I, I, I hate my life and don't want to go on living oh leave me alone for my few remaining days Job is a person that is in a very difficult circumstance Job has, has all the, the, the things that we would, uh, that, that we would suggest are, uh, uh, would relate to depressive symptoms. Job is at the point that he wants to give up so much so that even his wife is telling him, Job, you've been going through so much trouble. You've been so despondent and depressed uh, and disappointed. Why don't you just curse God, go kill yourself and die? I wonder what could cause a person to give up. What are the things in our lives that we face that could cause someone to want to throw in the towel? I wanted to just express to you all just a few statistics and talk a little bit about this uh, this very important issue. As a matter of fact, the, the, the levels or the amount of suicides is on the rise in America. And we don't really know, but what we, well, we don't really know why, but we do know a few things. We know that there are people, more people out there that are hopeless and helpless, and they do not know what it is to, that they can do to deal with their existential plight. Many times you would be surprised that the person even sitting next to you or the person sitting around you or even the person living in your house has even thought about it or has been wrestling with the fact of why am I alive? Why has God placed me here? What contribution am I here to make? Am I worth anything? So why is it, or what leads people to commit suicide? Let me give you a little statistics first. Is that all right? Suicide is the 10th leading cause of death, according to the Centers for Disease Control, for all ages in America. Every day, approximately 105 Americans die by suicide. There is one death by suicide in the U.S. every 13 minutes. Suicide takes the death of over 38,000 Americans each year. It's an estimated quarter million of people each year become suicide survivors. So while only 38,000 per year, uh, 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 38,000 per year actually commit suicide, at least 500,000 or at least a half a million attempt to kill themselves every single year. There's one suicide for every estimated four suicide attempts in the elderly. Suicide uh, 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 among males is four times higher than that of females. It's not that they, uh, it's not that they uh, decide to commit suicide more than women, but they choose more debilitating and, uh, uh, how do I put this, more debilitating and permanent methods of suicide. Men, the, 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 chosen cho the, the chosen means of suicide is usually uh, involves a gun to the head. For women, they tell us that usually females attempt suicide by swallowing pills or by cutting their wrists, things that you can be, things that you can come back from. They tell me that one in 100,000 children ages 10 to 14 die by suicide each year. That 12.7 in 1,000 young adults by the ages of 20 to 24 die by suicide. That suicide is the fourth leading cause of death for adults between the ages of 16 and 65. They also tell us that lesbian and gay and bisexual kids, especially those that are African American, commit suicide three times more likely than their white counterparts. 
The truth of the matter is, for many of us, we have all, we have all at least encountered someone who has either contemplated or attempted suicide. And the question is, what it is that we, what is it that we can do to help those that are on the brink of giving up? What can we do uh, for those of us that are here suffering in silence and, and suffering without telling people that we're going through some really debilitating stuff? What are the things that we can do to help ourselves move from wanting to give up to wanting to understand that God has designed us for a purpose and that God, though he designed us for a purpose, even though we go through trouble, one day the Bible tells us trouble will not last always. Where do we get the courage to soldier on? Where do we get the courage to not give up? So what is it that leads to suicide? Now while there, while there is no common or no single cause for suicide, suicide most often occurs when stressors exceed current coping mechanisms or coping abilities of people who are suffering from a mental health or, or psychosocial condition. Depression is the most common condition associated with suicide and it is often undiagnosed or untreated. The truth of the matter is, I don't know how many times people have come, uh, husbands and wives, where the husband or the wife was, was clinically depressed and, and I've had to have conversations with them at the fact that depression is a disease. And many of us, we don't see it that way. But the truth of the matter is, you wouldn't tell someone who was crippled in a wheelchair that they should get up and walk. And so it's hard sometimes to deal with people that are depressed. And a lot of people, we sweep it under the rug because we don't really want to deal with it. But the truth of the matter is, suicide occurs among those who are undiagnosed or untreated with depression more than any other debilitating illness. It's important to note that most people who actively manage their mental health conditions lead more fulfilling lives. But those that suffer in silence, those that refuse to get help, okay, those that look like many of you all with melanin in your skin that don't think you need help, that think that you can go to just your pastor and get prayer for your existential problems and you don't have to go talk to a professional. Well, take it from your pastor who's also a professional. Don't go to your pastor, go to a professional. Do you, all, you all understand what I said to you? Your pastor can pray for you. Your pastor can walk you through the thus saith the Lord, but the pastor cannot help you deal with your coping mechanisms. The pastor can't help you go and see a psychiatrist to get help in order to get some stabilizers for your mood if you're really sunk deep into clinical depression. The pastor can't help you with that. But I'll pray for you. Pray for you. One thing that I want you to see is what are some of the warning signs that some of the people that we are close with or tied with are contemplating or thinking about committing suicide. This is the most important thing that I wanted to give you. Something to look out for when we're concerned that a person may be suicidal is a change in behavior or the presence of entirely new behaviors. This is the sharpest concern if the new or changed behavior is related to a past problem or loss or precipitating event or change. Most people who take their lives or attempt to exhibit one or more warning signs either through what they say or what they do. We have a few. Take a look at talk. If a person talks about being a burden to others, that's a warning sign. If a person talks about feeling trapped or experiencing unbearable pain or having no reason to live or if someone continues to joke about killing themselves, perhaps maybe they're suffering with something that you need to get them some help with. Then there's behavior. What are some specific things as it relates to behavior that we can look out for? Uh, an increased use of alcohol or drugs. Uh, acting recklessly or withdrawing from activities or isolating from family and friends or sleeping too much or sleeping too little or visiting people and randomly uh, calling people to say goodbye or giving away their prized possessions. That's a warning sign. Looking at people's mood, uh, uh, people who are contemplating suicide often display one or more of the following moods. They're depressed, or they lack an interest in things that they usually be interested in. 
They have fits of, of rage or uncontrollable anger. They have increased irritability. They, 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 they have increased anxiety. These are warning signs you can pay attention to. Health factors. Mental health conditions like uh, depression or a bipolar disease or schizophrenia or a schizoaffective disorder or a conduct disorder or a psychotic disorder or psychotic symptoms or anxiety induced symptoms. All these things are warning signs that people may be heading down the slope, especially when you know someone has a psychotic disorder and they're self-medicating or not taking their medication. Environmental factors. Let's be honest, sometimes events in life drive us to the point that we want to get up, give up. We lose a job. We lose a relationship that was important to us. A divorce or, 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 or a death. Prolonged, uh, prolonged uh, stress factors or prolonged uh, harassment or prolonged relationship problems or prolonged in unemployment or, or, or access to lethal methods to carry out what, what debilitating things are in your mind. All these things are environmental factors that we need to pay attention to when people are struggling or wanting to give up. The last one I have here is, is historical factors. Maybe perhaps someone previously attempted it. Maybe as a child or maybe a, 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 as an adult. Th those, are, those are things that you pay attention to. But most, mo most importantly, uh, is there a family history of suicide attempts? Some things, as unfair as they are, are passed through our genetic code and our DNA. These are warning signs that, that people may be heading down to the point that they want to give up. But the Bible tells us about an Old Testament character for our lesson as to how to deal with it by the name of Job. His sufferings are contained in the book that re records his feelings resulted from all of the losses that he's experienced in his life. The crucible of his life has led him to experience more distress and disease and disappointment and despair than any normal human being could handle. As Job springs onto the scene of the Bible, we're told that Job was a man of great wealth. We're told that Job, if you look at the prolegomena, or if you look at the context, we're told that Job had it all, that he had all the money he could need. He had all the children. He had 10 children to be exact. And if we were to look at it anachronistically, you would say now that someone with 10 children will be broke as I don't know what. But in biblical days, if you, if you were rich, you had more kids. And the more kids you had, the more money you had. And, and, and the Bible tells us that he had all the livestock that he could want. And he had a house that that, that people would marvel at. They tell us that Job had it all. And then one day, the Bible tells us without warning, without provocation, like an avalanche, adversity strikes in his life. He lost his livestock and he lost all of his kids and his servants left and, 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 and his house was taken. Soon, uh, soon thereafter, he lost the last human vestige of hope. He even lost his health. And in the midst of his pain and his great loss, his sickness, he makes a profound statement of hope and faith. And these words are recorded where we read them in Job, the 19th chapter, starting with the 25th verse. The Bible says this, after all of the things that have happened to me, after, after all the trouble that I've experienced, Job says in verse 19, but as for me, sorry, in verse 25, but as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and he will stand upon the earth at last. Verse 26 says, and after my body was decayed, yet in my body I will see God. Notice with me first in the text, three things. Notice with me first in the text, Job's certainty. Twice in the passage, Job states that there are some things that he knows with certainty. I'm going to give them to you. The first thing he states is that Job knows that there is a redeemer. Job knows that even though I'm going through trouble, even though trouble is all around me, even though I'm beset with sadness, even though I'm beset with gloom, Job stands up and says, I know at least one thing. My money may be gone. My home may be gone. My wife may be driving me crazy. My kids are in the grave. All of my possessions are now gone. But there's one thing that I know that even though my health is gone, one thing I know that my Redeemer lives. 
Now, not only did he know that there was a redeemer, but his affirmation of this redeemer has an antecedent before it. He says, not, he doesn't say that there is a redeemer, but he puts an antecedent before it. And he says that I know that my redeemer lives. And let me stop here and let you know that it doesn't matter what you know about Jesus. It doesn't matter what you heard about him. And it doesn't matter what you thought about him. It doesn't even matter what your mother or father told you about Jesus. Unless you know him for yourself, it means nothing. I don't care how much scripture you can quote. How much Boca Burgers and, and Worthington Foods you can eat. I don't care how many of them little red books that you can read. I don't care how much church you attend. If you don't know Jesus for yourself, and if, he does, if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, all the knowledge in the world won't help you. See, it doesn't matter if you know he rose from the grave if you don't believe he rose for you personally. It doesn't matter if you know that he holds the world in his hands if he doesn't live inside of your heart. It doesn't matter if you know he can do the impossible if you've never asked him to do the improbable or impossible in your own life. He says, I know that my redeemer lives. This is a personal statement of personal conviction. This is not hearsay or speculation, but truth uttered from a heart of assurance and a firm conviction. So what then is a redeemer? I'm almost through. What then is a redeemer? I promise to be done at 115 for those outside. So what then is a redeemer? There are three definitions in the Hebrew text. A redeemer could be one who repurchases, one who delivers from bondage, by paying a ransom, and I like this one the best, and this is the one used in the text. One who avenges, or better yet, one who gets even with your enemy on your behalf. I like that one. One that gets even with your enemy on your behalf. Now listen, let's be honest. Job could have said, I know my savior lives, and that would have been accurate, wouldn't it? Because we do serve a risen Savior. Come on, somebody say amen. He could have said, I know that my victor and my defender lives. And that would be accurate because after all, we know uh, God will fight our battles. He could have said, I know that my advocate lives. And that would have been accurate because we know he does make intercession for us before the Father. He could have said, I know that my comforter lives. And that would have been true because Job was in trouble. And he found that God was a brother, uh, uh, that God was a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. He could have said, I know that my burden bearer lives. And that would have been accurate because he does invite us to come unto him. All oh, who, 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 who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. He could have said, I know that my healer lives. Because ultimately, that would be accurate because we know that there still is a bomb in Gilead. We know that there's still healing there. But Job didn't say, my savior or my victor or my advocate or my comforter or my burden bearer or my healer lives. Job says, I know my redeemer lives. See, that means that Job knew something. Job knew that this attack he was under that the problems he was having, someone needed to do something about it and he didn't have the ability to do it himself. Job knew that he needed someone to purchase him back. He knew that ultimately he belonged to God but that sin interrupted that relationship. And he had confidence in God and in his goodness to say, I know my redeemer lives. He needed a redeemer because sin had taken over. He needed a redeemer because the devil was wreaking havoc in his life. He needed a redeemer because death was knocking on the door. He needed a redeemer because the devil was attacking his body. He needed a redeemer because evil was stripping him of his money, of his family, and his health. And I think it's a good time to tell you here that one day the devil is going to have to pay for the hell he reaps in our lives. One day the devil's going to have to pay for breaking our families apart. 
One day the devil will have to pay for the cancer he infects our bodies with. One day he's going to have to pay for the pain and the pestilence and the problems that he, he presents to us. One day he's going to have to pay for all the death and all the suicide and all of the problems that we face. One day the devil will have to pay. And so Job says, I know that my Redeemer, the one who will pay back my enemies... On my behalf, I know he lives. The second thing that's certain in the text is Job is certain, according to the text, that his body is not permanent. Job says this, but as for me, I know my Redeemer will live, and at last he'll stand up on the earth. We'll get back to that, the B clause of verse 25. And after my body has decayed, yet in my body I will see God. You see, Job began to realize the temporality of life, the fact that life can be and is fragile, and that our moral frame, because we are human, born in sin, shaped in iniquity, that our bodies will eventually fail because it's fallible, has imperfection. Disease does come. No matter what it is, cancer does come. Sickness does come. Pain does come. Even death for we mortals come. Job was certain that his temporal body was not permanent. As the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 5, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. What the Apostle Paul was saying is that when his flesh and his bones break down, and it will, when his body begins to break down, when his body begins to let him down, and I'm starting to figure out as I, trans, tr as I move into my late 30s, I, well, I'm already in my late 30s, as I move into my 40s, that the body doesn't work and act the same way. I woke up this morning and I had a crick in my knee. Now, I've heard my mother complain about cricks in her knees for years. And I never thought that I would arrive to the point that I would wake up and my bones would start cracking. But I realized just this morning that the body that you have will decay. That the body that you have will eventually give up on you. But what the apostle Paul was reminding us is that when this collection of blood and bones and tissues and cells breaks down, when this tent is destroyed, we have a building from God. We have a bigger, stronger body that we can look forward to that's waiting on us. Yeah, so when it's destroyed... so. I'm so concerned about what I'm going through with in this life that I'm focused so much on what I'm going through down here that I don't realize that there's a better place, that there's a better plan, that there's, uh, it's already been worked out, that the solution has already been provided, that the way has already been made straight, that the provision has already been made. I'm so concerned about what I'm going through that I, re that I don't realize one day this tent will be destroyed but a building will be created for me. The third thing, the third thing, I'm done. Tell Curtis to come, we have to go. The third thing that we get from the text that Job was certain of is Job was even certain that death wasn't the end. Beyond his certainty, Job expressed his confidence that even after his body was destroyed, yet in my body, I will see God. He says, I will see him for myself. Yes, I will see him with my own eyes. I am overwhelmed with the thought. Here's Job's joyous exclamation. He says, my eyes shall behold him. How my heart yearns within me. And that is the thought that should overcome our sorrows as well. In the midst of our pain and our hurt, we can hold on to the hope. That one day we shall see him. So what are the things we can do to overcome the feelings of sadness, the, un the feelings of wanting to give up, the difficulties that we face, the troubles, the trials that we're going through? What are the things? Here, I put up six things for you. The first thing is look to Jesus. It's tempting to believe that what you need to find are more answers to do better or to get yourself out of depression by sheer human effort. 
But what we need to do is begin to rest ourselves in Jesus' finished work. It's Jesus' job to deliver you. It's your job to rest in him. It's Jesus' job to take care of the problem. It's your job to put it in his hands. It's Jesus' job to make a way out of no way. It's your job to turn it over to him and let him work it out. The next one is worship. Listen, I've never seen someone as messed up, as tore up, as Job. You and I, on this side of earth, will probably never have all the frustrations that Job had. And here we see Job ready to die, wanting to give up, proclaiming that he knew his redeemer lived. If you take a look in the first chapter of, of Job, you'll, you'll see Job, he's, he's, he, he's worshiping even while he's wounded. That he uses his worship as a way to alleviate the pain that he was feeling. And I don't want you to feel that we have to get our worship right all of the time. But as we turn our focus to God and as we, as, as we let the music that permeates our soul, the, the, the inspirational music permeate our soul and as we dig deep into the word of God and as we lift up our voices to declare unto the Lord that he's worthy, as we magnify the Lord, not because we're out of something, but we magnify the Lord because we still have breath as we exercise the worship that we were created for, we'll notice that some things will get alleviated. Some problems would change. The third thing, be around community. The enemy prowls like a, rolling, like a roaring lion seeking anyone that he could devour. And so just as the lion wants a gazelle to step away from the herd in order to destroy it, so the enemy too wants you to be away from the pack so he can get to you. The blessing of community is that we all don't have to have it together. We've been talking for three weeks now about this being a loving church. You see, the fact of the matter is, I don't care what your problem is. If you know how to love people, you can learn everything else. You can't teach people love. You can't teach people unconditional acceptance. You can't teach people the art of joy and hospitality. We have that. I don't care whatever else we don't have. If we have that, we can learn everything else. Be in community. The next is stop replaying the tapes in your head. A lot of times we get to the point where we start thinking to ourselves, well, maybe I'm not saved. Maybe God doesn't love me. I need to clean up this area of my life before God will save me. And anxiety and depression feed on a pattern of asking the same questions over and over again, even if we've already answered them. It's almost like being constantly in a war in your head. Taking your, your thoughts captive is not just a practice for issues of anger and, and lust, but taking your thoughts captive sometimes means not answering the questions or condemning thoughts that pop into your mind. Yes, God loves you. Yes, you are acceptable to God. Stop asking God dumb questions. He would not have died for you if he didn't love you. He wouldn't have died for you if he didn't forgive you he's already forgiven you he's already died for you he's already paid the price the next one the next one is serve serve others you see service gets our eyes off of ourselves and on to others see it's easy to think that my life my life is worse than everyone else's it's easy to think that but then when you start getting with other people and you realize, man, I may not, I may, may not be, they may be ready to come take my house, but geez, there are people that live on the street. I may not be able to get that new pair of shoes, but there are people out there with no shoes at all. You see, serving others allow us to get an inclination or an understanding that maybe we are more blessed than we give God credit for. Next one is meditate on scripture. You know, when you're battling anxiety or depression, 
your tendency is to read the Bible in order for the Bible to continue to convict you or to judge you. So if I'm feeling bad about myself, I look through the Bible to find text or scripture that says that God will condemn me, that God will turn his back on me. There's a reprocessing that's required when you read the Bible when you're anxious or depressed. You have to look for the scripture that will lighten your load. That will make you feel as if God loves you beyond a shadow of the doubt. And the next thing, the last thing is get some help. Listen, we need to break out of this idea that we don't need help for our problems. If you need help, get help. Job ends it this way. Verse 25, the B clause. But as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives and he will stand upon the earth at last. You know, one day God is coming back and one day our Redeemer and one day our burden bearer and one day the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star, the altogether lovely, the chief cornerstone, the stone cut out of the mountain, the almighty God. One day he's coming back and he'll stand on the earth. And I don't know about you, but I know that one that I'm glad for one day. I'm glad for that day that God will come to wipe every tear from our eyes, to wipe away every problem, to deal with every stain and spot of sin.